Blessed be God, most holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. And blessed be God's reign, now and forever. Amen. with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, whose will it is to restore all things in your well-beloved Son, the King of kings and Lord of lords, mercifully grant that the peoples of the earth, divided and enslaved by sin, may be freed and brought together under his most gracious rule, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Daniel. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingdom is one that shall never be destroyed. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 93. <clears throat> we will read it responsively. The Lord is king. He has put on splendid apparel. The Lord has put on his apparel and girded himself with strength. He has made the whole world so sure that they cannot be moved. Ever since the world began, your throne has been established. You are from everlasting. The waters have lifted up, O Lord. The waters have lifted up <clears throat> their voice. The waters have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the sound of many waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. Mightier is the Lord who dwells on high. Your testimonies are very sure. And holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever and forevermore. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? And Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew, am I? 
Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, So you are a king? And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'm preaching from the pulpit instead of from a chair in the first couple of pews, not because I want to look high and mighty, I don't, but because my breathing is better for preaching. Um, I have more lung space. Today, we've just walked in on a discussion, more appropriately called a sparring match, between Jesus and Pontius Pilate. It's unbalanced, of course, because Pilate, the Roman governor of all Judea, including Jerusalem, has the governing and military weight of Rome behind him. He can say whatever he likes, in whatever manner he likes, because he's top man in Jerusalem and the territory. Jesus has nothing like that, as he makes clear to Pilate. No governing structure, no army, just a ragtag bunch of disciples who will soon desert him when they themselves feel threatened. Pilate probably doesn't even have to question Jesus before condemning him to death. He only would have to agree to the wishes of the Jewish temple officials. Now note that this passage begins, then Pilate entered the headquarters again and summoned Jesus. Jesus had been arrested by Roman soldiers and Jewish police earlier in this chapter of John. And they had already brought him to Pilate's headquarters because they, as Jews, were not permitted to put him to death. And so Pilate is shuttling back and forth between Jesus indoors and the soldiers and Jewish officials outdoors because these Jews are maintaining their purity before the holiday of Passover. To go into a Gentile's quarters would apparently mean that they were no longer pure for the coming religious holiday. And so I wonder what's going on in Pilate's head. You might think that my wonder is beside the point because we already know how the story is going to proceed. But Pilate probably has to play through this scene carefully in the interests of Rome and in his own political interests. He doesn't want to be demoted and called back to Rome, and he could be. We don't have actual historical knowledge of this, but theologian Marcus Borg supposes that Pilate, who was a coastal resident north of Jerusalem and was not a resident of Jerusalem, arrived there perhaps on the same day Jesus did. Pilate entered Jerusalem through one gate probably on a war horse with soldiers attending him and with full military pomp and circumstance. Jesus rode into the city through another gate 
riding on a donkey. Traditionally, entering the city on a donkey symbolized arriving in peace, rather than as a powerful king arriving on a horse. Pilate was arriving to keep the Roman peace. The Romans would have been especially concerned on the occasions of religious observances like the Passover, especially the Passover. Tens of thousands of Jews would pour into Jerusalem. And Passover, with Jesus drawing crowds of followers, would be the most likely time that an anti-Roman rebellion could catch fire. Pilate probably decided that he had to be on the scene. A rebellion could theoretically overrun the Roman garrison of soldiers. And at the same time, the Jewish religious authorities would have wanted no rebellion because many Jews could be killed. Both would foresee rebellion if the crowds of Jews were acclaiming Jesus as King and Messiah. So Pilate is probably very concerned with granting the Jewish authorities what they want, which is Jesus' execution. But Pilate apparently wants to question Jesus, even if the foreclusion is a foregone one. He may be very curious to hear from this man who attracts and captivates the people and who is said to heal and teach with insight and authority. Jesus is said to have even brought a dead man back to life. Are you the king of the Jews, Pilate asks. Jesus answers this question with a question, which doesn't surprise us. And Pilate responds with a sarcastic question of his own. I'm not a Jew, am I? He is asking how he could be expected to know Jewish law about blasphemy which was the very serious accusation against Jesus. What have you done? And Jesus' reply here, again indirect, is the heart of this whole verbal sparring match with Pilate. My kingdom is not from this world, he says. If it were, my followers would be fighting for me, but my kingdom is not from here. Pastor David Lose has a good take on this, I think, and I will paraphrase. I've read what Jesus says here as denying his connection to this worldly kingdom that includes Pilate and his Jewish accusers. Jesus might be claiming his independence, saying that, in this, saying that this world and its powers ultimately cannot determine his fate. And this is true. But earlier in the Gospel of John, he said, and earlier in the Gospel of John, he said, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. What Jesus might be meaning instead of just that he is independent of power is that he and his followers of this world, if were he and his followers of this world, Pilate's world, then naturally they would use the tool that this world always uses for establishing and keeping power, violence. But Jesus is not of this world, and so Jesus will not defend himself through violence. Jesus will not usher in God's kingdom by violence. Jesus will direct no followers to be violent. Instead, Jesus has come to witness to the truth, the truth that God is love, and that because we have not seen God and we have such a hard time imagining God, most often our imaginations are dominated by our experience in life. So rad, rather than imagining that God is love, we imagine God to be punishing and violent because we live in a world of violence. 
rather than recognizing the cross as a symbol of sacrificial love, we think of it as a mechanism for punishing Jesus, killing him instead of us who feel we deserve it. Because we have so much experience with violence, even if we haven't brushed up against it personally, we've heard about it and read about it, watched it on TV. Rather than believing that God's grace and acceptance are absolutely unconditional, we assume that God offers love and power only on the condition that we fear, obey, and praise God because so much of our life is quid pro quo. You do this for me, I'll do that for you. But Jesus is not of this world, and therefore his followers will not fight for him, because to bring the kingdom about by violence is to violate the very principles of this kingdom and bring its destruction. Could there be a timelier passage to reflect on the excessive use of force by some police, particularly against people of color? On the number of our more recent wars in succession that we have engaged in around the world? This is at the cost of many lives, and we don't really even count the lives that are lost by our opponents in these wars. We live in a world of gender violence, and this includes domestic violence. We live in a world dominated by the view that the only answer to violence is more violence, and the end result of this view is death. Now, I do believe that worldly authorities have a vital role to play in creating a more orderly and a more just world. But we live in this world with its violence. And so I think the perpetrators of violence and terrorists everywhere should be resisted with determination and brought to justice whenever possible so that there is less violence in the world. But as members of the church and followers of a very different kind of king, we also need to witness that there are real limits to the reach and outcome of force. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his last book, titled, Where Do We Go From Here? The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. Through violence, you may murder the liar, but you cannot murder the lie nor establish the truth. Through violence, you may murder the hater, but you do not murder hate. In fact, violence merely increases hate. So it goes. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And so, following Jesus, looking for signs of his kingdom here and now among us, and attempting in our many small ways to drive out darkness, we can sing this hymn. The king of love my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth never. I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. Thanks be to God for his grace and goodness towards us. Amen.
let us recite a statement of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> we believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <clears throat> On this last Sunday of the liturgical year, we celebrate the Feast of Christ the King. As we reflect on the meaning of Jesus' reign over our hearts, let us pray for ourselves and for the world, saying, May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in positions of power, that they may govern with wisdom and integrity, serving the needs of their people, May your reign come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, the sign of your reign, that it may extend your welcome to people of every race and background. May your kingdom come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Christians of every denomination, that together we may come to understand the royal priesthood you bestowed on us in baptism. May your dominion come. We pray for all those whose commitment to truth brings them into conflict with earthly powers that they may have the courage to endure. May your rule come. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick and suffering, especially those affected by the coronavirus and for those listed here who are near to our hearts and those we name silently or out loud. May your kingdom come. Lord, hear we pray for all who protect and serve, as well as their families, the police, the firefighters, emergency medical personnel, and those serving in the military, especially those listed here who are near to our hearts and those we name silently or out loud. May your rule come. For those in our parish family celebrating birthdays this week, Serena Baynard, and for those celebrating anniversaries this week, Al and Evelyn Carey, may your reign come. Lord, we pray for this community of faith that attentive to your word, we may always worship in spirit and truth. May your reign come. Lord, Let us be mindful of the dead, especially Steve and Dorothy Reshi, Joseph Reshi and Emma May Compton, for whom the altar flowers are given, that they may come into the fullness of life, united with God in the communion of the faithful. May your kingdom come. Lord, Loving God, you have taught us that the power of the heart is greater than the power of wealth and might. Hear us as we pray for the fulfillment of your reign. We ask this through Jesus, our King. To him be glory and power forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. 
Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your work and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning. Good morning. Are there announcements before I do mine? All right. We have a few. We'll, we'll get him. Oh, oh, you have one? Uh, yeah. No? Oh. <laughs> it's not so. Yes, I do have an announcement. Microphone. Many, many ask me to tell everyone that there are baked goods. Uh, microphone. <laughs> Many asked me to tell you that there are baked goods for coffee hour. That's the good news. The bad news is we don't know if we have coffee. We do have coffee. We do. We do. Yeah, Mike took we care do. of it. Okay. Yeah. Minnie's happy now. Yeah. So, as I was saying, I was uh, calling on some clients, and this is unusual, but it, it struck me, and, and I've, I've had this for a couple of weeks. I wasn't here last week, but I, I wanted to, to just make an observation here. You know, we, we fret about things in our, in our lives every day and you know, how are we going to get through this or how are we going to take care of that and so forth. And this was on his desk and uh, it was one of those oh wow moments that I had. 
And uh, he gave it to me, and I, I just wanted to share it with you and just you know, keep, keep things in perspective. It says, good morning, this is God. I will be handling all of your problems today. I will not need your help. <laughs> so relax and have a great day. Isn't that profound? Uh -huh. I loved it, and, and I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Uh, do you want to go? Good morning. I am grateful for the opportunity to speak with you for a few moments about stewardship and why supporting Trinity is important to my family and me. In the past few weeks, we've heard some of our friends speak about how even small daily sacrifices like foregoing a cup of Starbucks could help fund generosity toward Trinity. We've also heard moving stories about how Trinity has been a part of our lives for, in some cases, generations. We want to keep that legacy going. And Joe Kirkner nominated Seth to plan the 200th anniversary celebration in 2068. <laughs> Seth will be 63 then. <laughs> Just as Joe is planning for the future, I want us to think about the future. All of us here and online feel strongly that we want Trinity to have a future. If you would, imagine for a moment what the future looks like. What does the church building look like? Is it dignified and beautiful? Does it have modern touches such as a modern HVAC system, newer fixtures, a state-of-the-art office? What do you hear? The hubbub of greetings during the passing of the peace, the squeal of a delighted child, or even the cries of a tired one, the harmony of a choral anthem, the thunder of an organ. Are the pews full? How many people are joining us online? What do the people look like? Older, younger, wearing dresses and sport coats, or wearing dirty, torn clothing? Is there a diverse mix of races and ages? How are we touching the community around us? Do visitors feel welcome? Is our social hall a frequent gathering spot for community events? How are we helping the poor, the ill, veterans, children in need? We have an opportunity to create our future, but let's face it, many of us won't be here in 2068 to see it. I'm, I'll be almost 100 by then. <laughs> Our responsibility is to build upon what our ancestors built. Make it strong, make it sustainable, and keep it relevant in our community. How do we do that? By investing in Trinity. How do you invest? Money is one way, obviously. We need money to operate. We need pledges during the stewardship campaign to establish a budget. Will we be able to afford special outreach programs? Will we be able to, to maintain our beautiful historic home in Coatesville? But we also need time. Time is a more finite resource than money. We can waste time, but we can't lose time. We can't really gain more time. So giving your time to the church, whether it be volunteering at the veterans brunch, helping with a work day, cleaning the kitchen, serving coffee hour snacks, helping in the office, painting, anything. Anything volunteers do for us, the church doesn't have to pay for. And it's fun and fulfilling to work toward a common goal, fulfilling the Lord's work. I urge each, you each to think of what Trinity means to you and what this incredible church could mean to future generations as you prayerfully consider your stewardship pledge for 2022. And don't remember to raise your hand to help either. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So this Thursday is Thanksgiving Day. So there is, there is no healing service this Thursday. Uh, next Sunday... We, uh, for Sunday in Advent, uh, and we have our funeral service, our memorial service for Judy Vanell uh, at 11.30 a.m. next Sunday. Our Coatesville Christmas Parade is coming up quickly, Saturday, December 4th. You look puzzled. Did I say, miss something or no? No. <laughs> uh, let's see. Breakfast with Santa is also coming up quickly, Saturday, December 11th. We're doing, what should you say? Breakfast to go with Santa. Uh, we'll have our vestry meeting on Sunday, December 12th at 11 a.m. That's rescheduled from today. And our Angel Tree Christmas. Um, I see some people have taken some, some names, but we do have um, angel tags with the names of, of children. Well, this year we're, we're serving a variety of children in Coatesville, those that have incarcerated parents, uh, children at the CYWA, and also Thistle Hills. So if you're interested in purchasing some gifts for children in the community, there are still some angels hanging up there with names and some gifting ideas. And there will actually be um, a Christmas party 
at, held at the Thorndale Volunteer Fire Hall on Sunday, December 19th from noon to four, where uh, the children will be given the gifts. Santa will be present, so if you're able to come, you're, you're welcome to come then to that party as well. Um, is that enough? There are lots of announcements in the bulletin, so I'll stop there for now. Anyone else have any announcements? Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and good and joyful to give you thanks, O holy God, source of life and fountain of mercy. You have filled us and all creation with your blessing and fed us with your constant love. You have redeemed us in Jesus Christ and knit us into one body. Through your spirit, you replenish us and call us to fullness of life. Therefore, joining with angels and archangels and with the faithful of every generation, we lift our voices with all creation as we sing. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of the universe and giver of life. You formed us in your own image and called us to dwell in your infinite love. You gave the world into our care that we might be your faithful stewards and show forth your bountiful grace. But we failed to honor your image in one another and in ourselves. We would not see your goodness in the world around us, and so we violated your creation abused one another, and rejected your love. 
yet you never ceased to care for us and prepared the way of salvation for all people. Through Abraham and Sarah, you called us into covenant with you. You delivered us from slavery, sustained us in the wilderness, and raised up prophets to renew your promise of salvation. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your eternal word, made mortal flesh in Jesus. Born into the human family and dwelling among us, he revealed your glory. Giving himself freely to death on the cross, he triumphed over evil, opening the way of freedom and life. And on the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And as supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering his death and resurrection, we now present to you from your creation this bread and this wine. By your Holy Spirit, may they be for us the body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And grant that we who share these gifts may be filled with the Holy Spirit and live as Christ's body in the world. Bring us into the everlasting heritage of your daughters and sons, that was Cyril, our patron saint, and all your saints, past, present, and yet to come, we may praise your name forever. Through Christ, and with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us, we sing. Hallelujah, be known to us, Lord Jesus, in the breaking of the bread. Be known to us, Lord Jesus, in the breaking of the bread. Hallelujah. The gifts of God for the people of God.
Our service continues with the post-communion prayer. So let us pray. God of abundance, you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who make this earthly pilgrimage with us. So be swift to love and make haste to do kindness. And the blessing of God, who comes to us as creative force, redeeming presence, and life-giving spirit, be upon you and all whom you love and pray for, this day and forever. Let us go forth into the world in the name of our Lord, the King of Peace. Alleluia, alleluia.